This is us, is the series that we are digging into. We're looking at our mission and our vision. Our mission is to make disciples. This was Jesus' idea. He gave it to us, the Great Commission mission. Our vision is to light the 1-5, starting in our 46815 zip code, all the way to 15 global regions, all the way around the world. Local partnerships, global partnerships become avenues for us to do some of those things, but it all happens when we come together as God's church to do what Jesus prescribed. We're looking right now at the method of going after that mission of being light, of being the vision that God has for us. And it is threefold. It's gather, connect, and go. Mark chapter 3, verses 13 and 14 gives us kind of a picture of what this gather, connect, go method looks like. Jesus called the disciples, and they came to him so that they could be with him. This is gather. They gathered together. Then they connected. He appointed 12 Two things happen so that they would be with him, they would know him, they would be in relationship with him. They sat in circles, they asked dumb and silly questions, and Jesus walked with them through every bit of that. They connected, and they also appointed the 12 so that he could send them out. This is the go part. And so we, as a church, we hang our hat on asking three things of every church member, and that is to gather Make a worship service every week a big priority to connect, be in a life group, be in community that's beyond just the rows you sit in, and we're going to talk about that today, so that next week we'll look at how we can go, how we can serve, how we can give, how we can be used by God to do greater things than we could ever do on our own. So this is where we're at right now. This is us today. We want to not just talk about what Jesus said. That's one thing. We're here to do that. We talk about the things that Jesus said, the commands in Scripture. We talk about the Word of God every single week. But we don't want to be a church that just talks about what Jesus said. We actually want to do what Jesus did. We don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with us in our weaknesses because he's walked where we've walked, yet he's done it without sin. He showed us what it looks like. So we want to be a church that walks the walk as well as talking the talk. So let's talk about the connect part. Today, let's look at connect. Why life groups? Why do I need a life group? Why do I not just settle in with coming to church, maybe watching online sometimes, and just let that be enough? Why is that not enough? Can you show me why? I'm glad you asked. Today, we're going to dig into John chapter 15. These are the words of Jesus, and this is the passage where Jesus is the vine passage. John chapter 15, I encourage you, read the whole chapter this week, some great material to just dig deeper into the word of God this week. But Jesus says, hey, I'm the vine, you guys are the branches, apart from me, you can't do anything. Can I get an amen? I believe some of you already know that. Some of you are seeing that, maybe realizing that in your lives today. Apart from me, you can do nothing. He's our vine. He's our life-giving source of everything. And he talks to us about abiding. You'll see that word one time, at least in the passage that we're going to read. But in the chapter, the word abide, it means to, to keep going, to stay connected, to endure, to persevere, but even to rest, even to, it has a sense of like be at home with, being a part of the family of God. What a beautiful picture. And so as Jesus describes that, he gets to these verses and he talks about his command. So let's read that passage together. John chapter 15, I'll read starting in verse 12. We'll go through verse 17. Anybody ready for the word this morning? Give somebody a fist bump at home or in the room. If you're ready for the word, let's dig in today. John 15 verse 12, Jesus says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, lasting, restful, continuing fruit, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Love one another. You notice love, love one another. This picture Jesus is giving us is what it looks like to abide, what it looks like to be connected to the vine, what it looks like to be a part of the family of God. Jesus is showing us a picture of that. And you know, here's the truth. Some of us in today's era, we're really good at gathering, 
or maybe we think we are, like, you know, I'm committed to showing up at church, or I, I watch online anytime I'm not able to be there on person, and we looked at that last week. Online is an on-ramp, but it's an on-ramp because it's not a destination. It's to get us to a place where we're truly connected as a part of God's family. This is what Jesus is describing. Some of us are really good at the gather part, perhaps, but maybe this is a part that we have been missing. Maybe you feel like a part of your faith has you wanting something a little bit more. Maybe it's like, well, I don't get enough out of Sunday mornings. And if that's where you're at, I would guess that your Monday through Saturday probably has a lot more to do with that than maybe the Sunday has to do with that. And I think today's message can help you take the next step in your faith. And here's the bottom line of all of this. We connect. Why do we connect? We connect because God values community. And what is community? Community is a, is a grouping usually of homes and places people live. It's, it's built on proximity. There is no community without proximity. We're in a community in the 46815 zip code because we're in proximity to the other homes in this same zip code. In our city, even in our county here, we're in proximity. And so community, we think of, of neighborhoods and things like that. But God values what that concept of community comes from. It was really his idea. We recently spent some time looking at the beginnings of Scripture as we know it and hold to it, all the way from Genesis through Abraham through Joseph. And the thread through that is, number one, it's Jesus. But why Jesus? Because God has a redemptive relational story that he is writing. He values community. He values relationship. And we see that throughout all of history. So why do we go deeper than just sitting in rows on a Sunday or watching on a screen on a Sunday? Well, because God values something more. Let me show you what that looks like. I'll give you four things today that we see from those verses, starting with verse 12. Number one, write this down. Community is God's plan. It's God's plan. That's what we're looking at. In verse 12, we see the beginning of what Jesus said. He said, this is my commandment. So I don't know about you, but if the creator of the universe, the one who is about to at this point, we know now that he did defeat death, hell, and the grave. He's beaten death. He's risen from the dead. If he says, this is my commandment, I think we should probably perk up and listen really closely. That's how this plan starts. It gets outlined. It's God's plan. This is my commandment. Community has always been God's plan. Don't miss this. Even from the beginning. God created the world and it was good, it was perfect, there was no sin. So there was a perfect world. And you know what God shows us in the midst of his generating, speaking into existence, the world, the universe as we know it. Do you know what God shows he values? Community, relationships. Let me show you. Genesis chapter two and verse 18 shows us this. Genesis two eighteen says, then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper for him. Now, it only occurred to me in recent years, I don't know why, that I never really connected the thought that God said this before sin entered the world. So even in a perfect creation, God valued community. God wanted us to be connected, number one, to him vertically, but then number two, horizontally to each other. He says, it is not good. He's been saying everything's so good. It's perfect. He says, but it's not good that man would be alone. God's plan is one of community. From Genesis to Jesus, community, through a redemptive relationship, a story that only God could write, has been his plan from the get-go. And then it leads from Genesis now to, let me give you a verse in Galatians. This is Paul's writing. After Jesus has been risen from the dead, churches have been established. I'm gonna walk you through some of that journey, the multiplication of the church in just a moment. But that has happened, and Paul is writing a letter to the churches of Galatia. And he says this in Galatians 6, 2. He says, bear one another's burdens. But don't miss what he says after that. Maybe that part sounds familiar. He says, bear one another's burdens. And what do we do when that happens? And so fulfill the law of Christ. So let's talk about this law of Christ. We know, first of all, we obey it. We fulfill it. As Paul writes it here to the churches at Galatia, we fulfill the law of Christ when we bear one another's burdens, when we love one another. This is based on what Jesus is saying, love as I have loved you. And the law of Christ is spelled out. If you wonder, well, what is that? I know what the law, you know, the first five books, Moses, the law of Moses and the beginning part of my Bible, I know some of those things. But what's the law of Christ? 
What does that mean? It's a good thing for us. Jesus spelled that out very specifically for us. He told us what that is. He says that it's in the model that he's given to us. In fact, it's in verse 12 of John 15 that we just read. It's love as I have loved you. Jesus spelled it out. And Jesus didn't just say what the law of Christ is. Jesus modeled what the law of Christ is. So the first thing is that community is God's plan. But the second thing is that community is Jesus' model. Jesus showed us what the law of Christ, that we are to fulfill, what it looks like. He didn't just say it, he showed it. And that is the second thing here, because in verse 12, he says, this is my commandment. Look there with me again. This is my commandment, what? That you love one another. But the the biggest part of this verse is the last part. He says, as I have loved you. And that takes me to John chapter 13. Jesus spells out, what's the law of Christ? What does it mean? What's this new commandment? John 13, verses 34 and 35, Jesus says this, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. And as he's saying this, no doubt, people that were listening would be like, well, that's, that's an old one. That's not new. That's been around forever. But Jesus would continue and say, a new command I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another, just like we see in John 15 and verse 12. The same language, the same phrase, this is the law of Christ. It's all summarized. Teacher, Jesus would be asked, what's the greatest command in all the law? He would say, well, it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, upon these two, all the law and all the prophets, they all hang there. This is what matters most to God. It, and I've shown you what it looks like. This is the law of Christ. This is the new covenant. This is the walk that we are called into. It's God's plan. It is Jesus' model. Jesus would then continue verse 13. Look there as we just read it. He says, greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. That's Jesus' model. There is no greater love than this, than one who would lay down his life, sacrifice himself for his friends. And that, my friends, is exactly what Jesus has done. He modeled the love that he calls us in to. And then what I love is don't miss this part and don't glaze over. I'm going to go through a bunch of verses. They're in your notes. I'm I'm not even going to read them all. I want to take you on a journey of how the model of Jesus multiplied. Because after Jesus was raised from the dead, he gave the great commission. He sent out those that he had called to himself. They were with him. They were sent out to preach. Now the beginnings of the church starts. This is why we are here. The model of Jesus has now multiplied. And there's a bunch of numbers. People will say, well, do you guys do numbers and stuff at Blackhawk? And I say, absolutely, every single time. And super spiritual people sometimes will be like, well, yeah, no no spiritual person would track numbers. And And I always want to respond, sometimes do, with, well, then you don't read your Bible because it's full of numbers. The early church was tracked with all kinds of numbers. I want to walk you through that. Here's why. Why do we track numbers? Here's the balance that every church struggles with. Like, you can become so much about metrics and numbers that you forget that it's God who brings the growth. Uh, Paul writes it. He says, hey, I, I planted Apollos water, but God brings the growth. We know that at Black Hawk. God is the giver of growth and of numbers and of people. But we also know this. We track and measure these kinds of things because the early church did, Scripture does, and because we believe this statement. Write this down. That every number number has a name, and every name matters to God. And I'm thankful that we see the numbers of Scripture remind us that these numbers are people that have a name. Sometimes you feel like, especially in a bigger church, you may feel like just a number. But we want you to know, and God wants you to know, that he sees the name behind the number. We are a number in a very big, billions now, by the way, of people this past Easter worshiped and celebrated and lifted high the name of Jesus. We're a part of billions, so yeah, we're a part of those numbers, but we have a name, and God knows our name, and every name matters to God. And I want to show you some of these numbers, how the model of Jesus multiplied in the book of Acts, starting in Acts 1, 15, we see the first number. Acts 1, 15, we see 120. Uh, In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers, the company of persons. This was before the day of Pentecost, before the church has really gotten off to its start. The number was about 120. So 12 had grown. That's pretty awesome. But this is where it starts. This is before the day of Pentecost. Acts 2, 41, this is the first day of the church. This is the day of Pentecost. Peter preaches, and we know that day, on its first day, 
that 120 member church, if you will, became a mega church because that day 3,000, some 3,000 people were added to the church. It got really big, really quick. Then you keep going, Acts 2, 47. We see that God added daily to those who were being saved. This is translated daily, day by day. So we know that would at least be 365 people every year. And we know that that was a very small number because of look what happened in the first day of the church. So this is all very conservative numbers. You see the model of Jesus now multiplying. Now it's over 3,000 and now daily people are being saved and being added to the church. Acts 4 and verse 4, we see that now the men totaled about 5,000. And if you add women and children to that number, very conservatively speaking, you're now at 15,000 or so. If you add uh, about three per family, which would be a very conservative estimate, you're at some 15,000 plus people. Acts 5.14 tells us more and more believed. And multitudes, multitudes, this means it was so big we could hardly count it. There are multitudes there, and now let's conservatively say most scholars would believe very easily At this time, numbers are growing to somewhere in the range of 100,000 people. And Jerusalem itself, look at uh, verse 28 of Acts 5. Uh, This is when they're being reprimanded in the beginnings of the church. And it's like, we told you not to teach in this name, yet now, don't miss this, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Jerusalem is filled, and and it would probably be about a quarter of a million-ish people, it's estimated during that time. So going on probably half of the city (laughs) has now become a part of the church. Can anybody say wow? Wow, we just thought Easter was packed in this place. Can you even imagine what was going on in this season? Acts 6, 1, now the, uh, the description, the description of how people were added, remember that word, added to the church every day? It goes from addition to multiplication. Acts 6, 1, we see what that looks like. The disciples were increasing in number, multiplying is the language here. Uh, and then we see what's going on. By the way, it just hit me. I was just trying to show you the numbers, but what happened when growth was going on? A complaint arose. Imagine that. You know, when we're growing and we're pursuing Jesus, just remember, you're not going to keep everybody happy. And, there, and, and that person that won't be happy probably at times will be you. Uh, but we've got to keep growing and keep digging into what God has. But what I wanted to show you is that it continued to multiply. Verse 7 of Acts chapter 6 is a very good picture where we see the number of believers has, decreased, uh, has, has increased, rather, multiplying rapidly. And we know that it has now gone from addition to multiplication. It's now exponential growth. I'm going somewhere. Hang with me. One more. Acts, let's go to Acts. I could keep going with the in-between, but let's skip to Acts 21, just so you can, I think you get it by now. Acts 21, verse 20. Look at this verse. And when they heard it, they glorified God. I, I can relate. And they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands. This is often translated, if you look at other translations, tens of thousands. Most likely that's what we're looking at there that are among the Jews who have believed. They are all zealous for the law. And the word there is myrias. It's the word from which we get our English word myriad, myriad, which is just way too big. We can't even begin to count it. So, you know, that's, everybody estimates 100,000 plus, but who knows? It may be way more than that, most likely was. We can't even count the multitudes and the exponential multiplication of what took place because of a model of a carpenter from Nazareth. Nothing good comes from Nazareth, they said. But he changed history with his love and then with this model of community. So where did they put all these people? You ever wonder that? If it's multiplying like that, they didn't have facilities like this and small group rooms. So what did they do? Where did they put all of these people? Somebody asked me. I'm glad you asked. I'm just going to pretend somebody did. I'm going to answer that with two verses. Acts 2.46. Let's read this one together. Day by day. So that means not just Sunday, by the way. They attended the temple together, and they broke bread. Where? In their, let's do that one more time, in their homes. This was way bigger than a building. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. Acts 5, 42, you see the same model. This is what they did with all of these people. This is how they were the church. This is the methods of Jesus that have now become this multiplying model all over the place. And every day, you see it again, in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. And so what do we see in that? In the gather connect, we see just that, gathering in large groups, 
connecting in small groups. You thought we came up with life groups maybe, or maybe some modern church came up with the idea of we call them life groups. These are five, you know, two, three, four, five, six, up to maybe 12 to 15 people who gather in small groups, usually in homes. Some use church buildings in different places and different locations. You may have thought we came up with some model like that. Really, it goes back to Mark 3. It was Jesus' idea. He started the first life group. And then they kept doing what Jesus did. Imagine that. And God blessed the model and multiplied it. That is what we see happening. We see large group gatherings and small group community taking place. That is what started the church. That is what God blessed in its early years. That is what God still desires to bless today. Why do we have this mission to make disciples, the vision to light the one five? And why is our method so simple, Pastor? Gather, connect, go. Well, that's what Jesus told us to do. It's what Jesus showed us how to do, and that's what we want to do. Throughout the New Testament, by the way, you'll see the the concept of the house. I'll give you one example uh, where they say, hey, greet the people, the church, in their life group, in their house church, meeting in so-and-so's house. Here's one, Romans 16 and verse 5, greet the church of their house. And then you see names that are constantly attached to all of these numbers. That's just one example. All right, community. It's God's plan from Genesis all the way to now. It's the model of Jesus. And number three, write this down, community makes faith personal. I want to get real personal with you now. Give me some history. Give me some context. Give me some biblical, historical precedent for why it is that community matters so much to God. Now let's make it really personal. And that is exactly what happens when you get into community, into relationship with others. It makes faith personal. If you stop gathering if you, if you stop with gathering, rather, like if you say, I'm just going to get in my row, and you stop with gathering, here's what you ultimately do. You kind of keep faith at arm's length. You keep it close enough you can keep an eye on it and claim it, <laughs> but far enough where it doesn't get too personal and up in your business and in your face. I have done church, even while being in ministry, this way many times before. And every single time I try to keep faith You know, I say it's personal, but I don't let other people in. I get the vertical part, and it's like, all I need is Jesus. And it's like, you know what? He is all you need, but he knows you and me so much that he said, you have found me, but I tell you now, go love each other. It's not just a vertical thing. The cross has two parts to it. Have you ever noticed that there's a vertical part and there's a horizontal part? And the horizontal part is very easy to keep at arm's length. And some of you right now, maybe you've been doing that for years. You're just afraid to let other people in probably because they've hurt you before. Uh, that's definitely been part of my journey. It's like, well, it's, I don't trust people. I trust Jesus, but I don't trust those knuckleheads. Can I get an amen? But Jesus said, you need more. You are made for more. You are made for community. You need each other. And community, as Jesus is prescribing it here, as we look at these verses, verses 14 and 15 is where we see this personal picture. Jesus gives this description of how you're not just my servants anymore. You're my friends. Sounds pretty personal, doesn't it? He, he's saying, I'm not just your master. Because, hey, a, ma- a servant doesn't really know what the master's doing. But, no, I've told you everything that my father has given me to tell you. And now I called you my friends, verses 14 and 15. Community vertically makes faith very personal. And then it spreads out horizontally today. And that's why life groups, what are life groups here? Like, if I had to put it into a little phrase, it's really our primary avenue for care. We're called to shepherd. We're called to care for the people. And a lot of times people are like, well, pastor, I don't know you real well. I couldn't get to know you personally. And that's why, listen, I'm not here to one another every single person. I can't do that. You can't do that. Our elders can't do that. Our staff can't do that. Our deacons can't do that. But through life groups, this scalable, sustainable model that Jesus built, every single person, every number that has a name and matters to God can receive pastor care from on high because we do it through each other and through the model of the church that Jesus built and said even the gates of hell can't tear it down. Life groups are how we care. It's all the highs of life. It's all the lows of life. Just like we can't do the one another's isolated and by ourselves, 
nor can a pastor. And that's why, listen, even in a season of transition, I know many of you may have come because it's like, well, you know, I can tolerate his teaching or whatever it might be or maybe even like it or whatever. Those are great on-ramps, but the church is not built on any one personality. It's built on these groups that are sustainable and scalable no matter who is at what helm, no matter who's in what position. We are God's church. We are the body, and especially in seasons of change. You need to be in community. We need each other. Look at your neighbor. Tell them, like I tell you all the time, tell them, say, you need me, and give them a good smile. You need me, and say, so do you. Tell them back. So do you need me. We need each other. I want to show you a picture of this. It's the cutest picture you're going to see all week, I guarantee it. Look at these guys. Let's do that one more time. Everybody, one, one three, one, two, three. Oh. <laughs> I've studied the sea otters there. I mean, it's, you can look at it online, not making this up. You know what they do? When they go to sleep or when they're taking a break, through all the highs and lows of life, the waves of the sea, these sea otters will hold hands. I mean, how cute is that, right? But it's bigger than cute. You know why they do this? As best as scientists can tell that have studied them, they just do this so that they won't drift apart. <laughs> And I say we learned something from the sea otters. 2020, global pandemic, man, it created a firestorm of isolation. And, you know, we, we dug into that and we stayed the church through that. But some of you have allowed even that, but maybe even before that, to be something where you don't lock arms with anybody. And you think you can lock arms with the other sea otters of the church from a distance. But God wants you to be connected so that we don't drift apart. And if that picture's not cute enough, here's a Mother's Day picture for you. Look, this is a mom and the baby. Oh, on three. One, two, three. That's as cute as it gets. And that's what happens sometimes when we're low, when we got no energy left. And moms, ladies in our lives, thank you. I can't even tell you how many times my mom has just held me up when I was just sinking. And how many times Jessica does that in our homes. Just the glue, the foundation that holds us together and even picks us up Maybe when we feel like we are drowning. Isn't that a great Mother's Day picture? It's also a great picture of community. It's a great picture of what God has called us to. They cling together so they don't drift apart. Jesus said, I've made you my friends. Let's do the same. Community makes faith personal. Last thing, number four, community makes faith purposeful. As soon as my faith gets personal at the level we've talked about, vertically, horizontally, then I can really make it purposeful. I can really engage in what God has called me to. Verses 16 and 17, we see this. What happens next? He says, you didn't choose me. I chose you and appointed you. This is where a purpose comes in. I chose you. That's personal. I choose you. You're my friend. You're not my servant, verses 14 and 15. You're my friend. Verse 16, he says, I chose you and I, I appointed you. It means I've got a purpose for you. What, what is it? To bear fruit. And that your fruit should abide, last be a part of who you are. It becomes your identity so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, now the purpose aligns with his will. It doesn't mean you get everything you want. It means you get everything the Father wants and your heart aligns with his heart for you so that these things I command you. Why? What's the purpose? So that you, say the last two words with me, love one another. Three words. Love one another. This is the purpose that Jesus has called us to when my faith gets personal I can become purposeful. This is why it's important to own your own faith, by the way. Faith should get personal. shouldn't be your grandmother's faith or your mother's faith or your dad's faith or your mom's faith. It should be your faith. When it gets personal, when Jesus gets in your boat, so to speak, he gets in your face and faith becomes personal for you, it's only then can it become purposeful. So own your own faith. Let your faith be yours. God's big enough to handle your questions. And one of the best venues for those questions to get answered is small group communities where you get to dig in together and walk through things together, through all the highs, all the lows. And here's the truth. In today's westernized American church model that is typical that we see around the globe today, uh, most people would say, I don't need, I don't need a small group. Maybe you say that. I don't need a small group. And in our typical westernized American church model, you're right. What we often make it, you don't really need a small group because it's like, well, I, I got social media, I can text, I can call. I don't need another friend to talk to. Maybe you say that, like, I got too many already. I can't keep up with the ones I've already got. Maybe you can relate with that. And in what oftentimes we end up making the church, you're right. But 
if we really look at what Jesus called us to do, to make disciples, if we're really going to make disciples, follow the model of Jesus that was always the plan that God has, then we are going to need some help way beyond what we've got. It's then when we look at the church through the lens that Jesus created it, knowing that this model was to make disciples through specific visions like lighting the one five that we have here at Blackhawk, then we realize I need more than just a casual friend. I need true relational connection as a part of God's family because when I don't, then whether I'm a toenail, a hair on the top of the head, an ear, an arm, a leg, then I cripple the body of Christ when I disconnect from the body of Christ. So I can't make disciples like Jesus modeled if I'm not connected to the body of Christ. I don't know about you, but I don't ever want to cripple the body of Christ. I don't ever want to make a toenail. You ever had, I had an ingrown toenail recently, man. I was limping around like some sorry joker. I couldn't do anything. It's like somebody dropped a ton on it, right? And even the little toenail being in line, it just affects everything. In the same way, you and your connection to the body of Christ affects everything because the task is bigger than us. This is why we believe circles are better and more important than rows. Definitely gather. These rows are here. You should be a part of them. It's commanded. It's a part of what we're called to do to gather, but so that we can go a step further and connect because a row can't know. Look at your neighbor and tell them, say, you don't know me. And they don't, they don't know you unless they're doing community with you, unless they're in community, totally connected. Some of you said that to your spouse. That was really fun to watch, by the way. (laughs) I'm definitely doing that again next service for sure. (laughs) And you're not known unless you're really doing life together. And that is God's plan for us, that we do life and we are known. A row can't know, but circles are where we discuss what we're struggling with, where we discuss the winds of our life. And the bottom line is this, you can't spell community without unity. You can't. Try it. It doesn't work. There's always unity. Anytime you pursue community, there will always be a pursuit of unity, and that pursuit can be difficult. And when we're spelling community with our life, we have to pursue unity. And in fact, that's why John 17, two chapters later, it's the high priestly prayer. Jesus prayed for his current followers and even prayed for us who would follow him later. In John 17, 22 through 23, Jesus prayed this. The glory that you've given me, he's praying to his father, I have given to them that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. So that, this is the purposeful part, so that the world may know that you sent me, and don't miss this last part, and loved them even as you have loved me. Now, two big things stand out to me in that. First of all, you mean I can be loved by God the same way that God loves his own son? We have no excuse to think we're not loved. And I know some people in your life have loved you so poorly, and it's affected your view of love. But Jesus' prayer for you And what's possible for you is that you can be loved, and you are loved. Look at me. You are loved by God in the same way he loves his own son. So that you can be a part of his plan. So that you can be purposeful. That's the part right before that. He says, why do we love? Why are we perfectly one? Why are we one as he and the Father are one? So that the world will know that Jesus was sent. So that the world will know who God is. But yet, let's get more personal more purposeful for a moment. There's plenty of pathways away from community. I want to give you one. Here it is. You can look at this, write this down. Here's a pathway from community. It starts with independence. This is just one. Your pathway probably looks different. These are some I words because when I become the focus of community, I drift away from community because it becomes about me. Independence is simply a pursuit of kind of being on your own. It's not being under the control uh, of any outside thing or person. All right, so that's where it starts. We're kind of an independent kind of world, but then it leads to isolation, and we start to cut other people off, and we end up on an island, and then it goes to individualism, which I believe is one of the greatest enemies of the model that Jesus established for his church today. We live in a very individualistic society, and what that really means is it's a habit, a principle even of being independent, or better yet, this is probably the biggest descriptor, and one of the biggest enemies that the enemy uses in you and me is self-reliant. We become self-sufficient 
when we become individualistic. We think that I got all I need. We rely on our self. I don't know how you fit into that category today, but maybe you've been on a pathway from community. I want to give you a pathway to community. Here's that pathway. We looked at the from, here's the to. And it gets really personal. Everybody take a deep breath. All right, honesty. Get honest. Get honest. And with these, I'm going to give you a personal question that you can ask, an application question, if you will. Honesty. Enough to admit I need some help. And I thought I could be self-sufficient, self-reliant, but I can't. So I want to ask you a personal question. What are you not being honest about in your life right now? What are you hiding? What are you covering up? Maybe nobody except you knows. Maybe it's a sin, a habit, an addiction, something you're doing when nobody is looking. Maybe it's just a need that you just won't confess. You just need support, but you don't know how to ask. I don't know what it is, but God knows what it is. So I want to challenge you. Get honest with God so you can get honest with yourself, and ultimately so you can get honest with others in an accountable relationship, a community relationship. Honesty then will lead to humility. (laughs) If if you get real honest, I guarantee you humility's coming next. Can I get an amen? If I get real honest with myself, I have to kind of humble myself and be like, you know what, that stuff I'm having to be honest about, it humbles me. And then the third part is harmony. Harmony with God harmony with his plan, with his model, with his purpose in your life, and then it ultimately leads you to harmony, unity even, with other people. So what step do you need to take? What are you not being honest about? How do you need to humble yourself? And lastly, with the harmony part, are you in a life group? You need one, and this is just one model. You need community, and we would love to help you take that step. So that Paul, as he wrote to the churches of Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, he says, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. We don't have it all figured out around here, not even close, but we're taking steps. And maybe you need to take a step too. And especially in the season of transition, I want to love you, father, pastor, shepherd you into reminding you that you need each other. And we want to help you be connected to the body of Christ. Can I get an Amen. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes, and ponder, what is your next step? What are you not being honest about? How is God humbling you in this moment? And as we think about that, believers are praying. Some of you would say right now today, I just don't know that if I were to die today, I'd spend eternity as a part of God's family. You talk about connecting horizontally. I need the vertical part. I know Jesus died for me. I know that he's alive. And I need to trust in that for my salvation. And the Spirit of God is prompting that in you. If that's you, pray something like this from your heart to his. Say, Jesus, I know you died for me. I'm such a sinner. My sin puts you on that cross. Today I give you me. I surrender all that I am to you. I trust you for salvation. I know you died for me. And I know you're alive because you rose from the dead. I trust in you. Will you forgive me? Will you save me? not just because we read it on the pages of Scripture, but because God himself declares it over your life. If that's the condition of your heart, you shall be saved. As all of us reflect today, may we just respond and take our next step right now in the silence of this moment.